Well, a business angel is something between a Gabriel, the angel up there, and Hell's angel. <laughs> he can change very quick, so <laughs> be aware of that. Normally, he is an entrepreneur who sold his company and hopefully has a little money in his pocket to invest. Many of these guys selling their companies is buying a house in France or Spain, and I did the other way around. I made a Hans Martin, I bought a house in the forest here outside Sundsvall and started from there. I discovered after a while that uh, it's quite boring to sit there, you know, to be in the forest on the tractor. You can do that for a while. So I started a new company doing fiber optic connectors for Ericsson mainly in my, my house on the countryside. And I got in contact with the university since we have been part of the cluster in Chista previously. My former job at uh, Electronic Group, and we started in 1990 with a, I bought a company which was completely bankrupt, was in the stock exchange. But I think I knew what I could do with it. So we, we started and what we did is we followed the market. We were very careful because we had no money. Same as Hans Martin, we started almost nothing. And I had to, I had to make 38 people redundant at the first day I took over. But we were quite careful to see what is the market going. And we had one, I had one belief that was in, uh, in uh, mobile phones. So we invested all we could in mobile phones. After 11 years, we grew up to business volume of 2.5 billion Swedish krona. And we were 1,100 employees with, I think, 18 subsidiary companies around the world. We had manufacturing in China, Philippines, we had in Estonia, Finland, and so on. We were on many markets. For me then, which liked to be very operative, after a while I realized that uh, I had to see uh, the company's activity through pyjamas papers, you know, these blue and white papers. And it wasn't particularly stimulating. So after 11 years, I think, as CEO of the group, I decided to take a pension. So I did. After two weeks, I was back in, in business again through the industry fund and who wanted me as chairman of one of the big investments. And that's the way it is so far. And uh, when it comes to the part of uh, business angel, where do you start? I mean, you see a lot of ideas here, and uh, one of the first criteria to look at is personality of the researcher or the entrepreneur. What is his situation, social status? Is he married? Is he depending on an income? Because as Hans Martin said, no fixed costs. We have to be quite flexible. The next we are looking for, does he have a customer? That's one of the crucial points. Because, as Hans Martin said, we need to have a customer who is demanding, pick up the best one. If he doesn't have, maybe the business angel can, pre-investment, try to find one and do the due diligence together with the, the uh, customer. The next question is, to whom do we send the invoice? Or how many customers do we have? What kind of category is it? And where are we in the value chain? Because if we develop, let's say, material which needs a further processing, which needs next step, for instance, if we should invent a new silicon and we should make transistors on top of that, it's a very long way to go until we get the order because we have to have approval in each, uh, in each step, in process steps. The next question is, what do we specify on the invoice? In some cases, you know, we even don't know what we are delivering. We have to define exactly what we do, the packaging of, of the product. The next question, why should he or she become our customers? We have to take out the, the excellence which we have. That's the next to define. And then the criteria for production. Because today to set up a production, if you go in uh, from business to business, let's say you do a component to the industry, the customer requires you from the beginning to have a quality assurance, environmental uh, policy, and so on. 
You must have a balance sheet. They don't accept you if you don't have money. They are doing due diligence on you. So it's not an easy start. So what can the business angel help him? Normally, he can invest the seed capital because today there is no other seed capital private. It's only from government you can get. And he can normally start up the company with the share capital. And if he says go or no go, if it's no go, he will vanish. He can pay in the share capital, as I said, and help to do the business plan. He shouldn't do the business plan. The entrepreneur should do the business plan. He has to think because then he will see all the, the difficult questions. Nobody else can do that than him. And try to introduce two customers if he doesn't have one. That is one of the key issues. And I would say 80% of a company is to have the uh, specification from the customer on the product. That is. And an innovation comes from the meeting with the customer and normally with different technologies. So if you could do an innovation, you need the customer first. When we come in to, to the activity, then we will come into the first phase in the company's birth. That's called the valley of death. And it can be, very, it can be a very long valley to cross, depending where you are in the value chain. And the definition of uh, value of death is the period when the company doesn't make any money. No customer pays your, your, pays your salary or your, your investment. You have to take it from somewhere else. I think in, in Sensei and Hal Martin's case, you were very lucky in the beginning to have the support. I don't think we can get that at all startup companies. What he, can, what he can do as next step is normally uh, there is required some venture capital. In your case, it wasn't, but in normal case, uh, this is very common, I would say. And uh, when taking a uh, venture capitalist on board, then you're getting close to the uh, health angels. For sure. Because when you see that contract, you will realize that the world is not so kind. And, uh, try to avoid it. And if you can generate profit to uh, grow the company, I, I must say that's the best you can do. Because the venture capital, he always has an exit. And as Hans Martin said, what is the exit then? The exit, the exit is normally sell the company. And we started a few companies in Stockholm and Archista a few years ago. And one of them was sold. We couldn't find any Swedish buyer of the company company or merging with a Swedish company. Actually, they came from the United States, came in one morning, made a due diligence and bought the company. And they can pay much more than uh, European because they look more on the cash flow and they are much more, I would say, venture, or, uh, venture uh, willing. They are, they are prepared to take risks. So most of, of the companies which are uh, financed by uh, venture capital is vanishing from Sweden. They are exported and with activity also. When we see this value of death, uh, as I said, this can be very long. And if you are very early, in, in, as I said before, in the value chain, it can take you up to five, six, seven years before you get the first income. That's, that's a long process. If you should have a new capacitor approved by, for instance, ADB to sit in, in the uh, trains, the approval process, even if you have references, will take around four years. That means if you come with a new product, uh, you need at least four to five years to get it approved from the final customer, depending where it is in the system hierarchy. But if it's attraction, that will be, uh, that's a horror. That means a business angel is not particularly keen of investing in this kind of product. It takes too long, too long time. We're also talking about uh, different kinds of customers. And uh, as you can see, this is a statistically, uh, 
definition of uh, the customer's way of taking new technology. And as you, as you see, we have early adopters. There are not many. They are the ones we have to find. But they are normally also not the most demanding. They are more on the concept on the latecomers, on the conservative side. So this is, this is a quite long process to, to define these kind of customers. When it comes to uh, next is the criteria for the business angel is what kind of IP he has. And patent, in my perspective, has no value. Only as a paper, not as it was designed to protect uh, know-how or an innovation. The patent has only value for the VC, for the venture capital, and if you're selling the company to the United States. Because a small company cannot defend a, a patent infringement. There is no way we can afford that. The money is used for development, for instruments, for material. But to take a patent slows down the whole process of the company itself. And uh, it takes too much time, it takes money, and you cannot defend it. A few months ago, I had dinner with Håkan Lanz, if you know this guy. And uh, he spent 100 million to defend his patent. And now I think uh, he, last year, he settled the last one, luckily. But it's too complex, and uh, you can think what could have done if he didn't have this problem. He spent uh, the last 10 years, you know, fighting with lawyers. Mm. Ah, okay. Then when you come into this venture capitalist, I think most of the companies is going to have venture capital. There is no other way. And when you look upon this contract, you will see a lot of, of uh, tough uh, tough regulations, what you can do. There is a reporting system and so on. And a small company is normally not organized to handle that. It is, uh, takes too much time. So before going into venture capital, uh, try to get as much as you can from Vinova, from KK, from Tilbex Verket, whatever they are. Because up to the demonstrator, there is no way you can finance uh, with VC because the pre-money valuation which they come in with is so low that uh, you are so uh, diluted that he takes maybe 80-90% of the company if you take the money on board too early. He should come as late as possible. And there I think uh, we know I can help because uh, we have to have proof of concept to get the, the, to get the right valuation. So here we can see the whole development of the company. And as you see, the value of deaths. I don't know uh, how many years that will take normally, but you can count on three to five years minimum to do this. And during that time, we have to have financing. And the most costly is the salaries. So if we can work without salaries, this is quite OK. That's the only way. Yes. That's why I said at the beginning, you have to check the social situation of your, <laughs> your partner. And other th income sources, normally the uh, entrepreneur who starts the company, the inventor, he has uh, some knowledge which he uses in consulting jobs to get some income into the company. If we are lucky, I think in one case here in Sundsvall, we were lucky to get a demanding customer. Uh, I was thinking of SEPs who really tells us exactly what to do. And I think they changed the whole process from us, for us. But you see also the, the way of investing. At the end here, the, the entrepreneur, the founder of the company, he owns only a few percentage. The rest is owned by VC. And the VC want to come out as soon as possible, as soon as they see there is a a possibility to get the money back. And normally they, they want to have an annual uh, interest of 20-25%. That's quite tough to reach. It also means that the entrepreneur has to sell when the VC says 
you have to sell when he's selling everyone has to do and normally the entrepreneur has to stay with the company for another two or three years after the sales it's tag along and drag along there's a lot of clauses in that contract and uh, not everyone likes that when it comes to the exit the uh, venture capital he can do whatever he wants and there is several ways to do it he can do a trade sales that means he sells this into a division like uh, Hans Martin said to sell into Honeywell for instance to become a division inside Honeywell or he can do an IPO he can go to the stock exchange there are many possibilities to, to go on the stock exchange that's also a way for the company to get financing but uh, as it works today uh, the stock exchange is not the place where you're normally getting money from. It's normally a way to, uh, to get the uh, shares sellable, so you can trade them. And some people in your company, or most of the people, can buy shares. So to get finance through the uh, IPO, it's normally very limited. And the IPO, after that, you have to employ one or two people just working with a reporting system for the stock exchange. I used to run a, a stock company for 11 years and I had the presentation on the industry in one of the forum in Sweden, in Sweden and Stockholm and I said if we were not, if we had not been on the stock exchange I would say we would be double so big, twice as big as we are because it takes a lot of power. It also takes uh, prevents you because every quarter you must present some kind of revenue and normally they want you to be every quarter should be better than the last quarter and in my case we were quite happy in the beginning because oh, nobody expected anything from us our share price was like a, a stamp when we were successful we were uh, best on the stock exchange for two years in a row then everyone focused on us and suddenly we got 3,000 sh new shareholders buying shares and then the board became very careful now that we have to provide money we have to show every quarter and I wanted to invest I had a lot of ideas what we, what we want to invest in but the board said no now we must give the shareholders so contrary to Hans Martins uh, we had to pay them and uh, I said if you don't have any ideas you can always give the money to the shareholders and I said that on one of the general assembly and it wasn't too popular but but for following this uh, this curve it's called S curve which uh, then shows the whole lifetime of a company and if we are not successful let's say we are limited so we can do a management buyout and that can be sometimes a very good solution because then you're, you get rid of the VC, you can run the company itself at least as you want, and it speeds up. And we can see many of these you know, companies who have been limited success with the venture capital. But as soon as an entrepreneur buys it, buy them out, sometimes to a fair price, then the company start growing again. That's uh, true. When we come to to stage, everyone who starts up the company will come to stage when he negotiates the pre-money valuation with the, uh, with the venture capitalist. And I will come back to that. That is most one of the most toughest moments for the entrepreneur when he's doing that. Because uh, suddenly somebody comes in and tells you your company is worthless. And still he's prepared to invest. But he tells you that it's, too, it's nothing. We need we need to invest too much and so on and uh, so he, he gives you a very bad offer and normally everyone gets quite upset when he sees that and uh, I can tell you I've seen many of these and uh, I also negotiated some of the pre-money valuation and that and on the other hand the venture capitalist is also uh, if they are buys, if they are good they realize also that the entrepreneur must have a fair share, otherwise he has no motivation. So he should have a fair share. 
and uh, but they would try to get as much as possible. Then they will also make some trick with uh, different uh, values of the shares, if it's called A, B, preference shares and so on, and to squeeze out the entrepreneur to reduce his power in the company. So they take, actually they take the, the lead of the company. That's something <laughs> we should have prepared with before we do. Another problem in this is the production, to produce a new, a new product. We always look who can produce, and we use a three words, beg, steal and borrow. That means to borrow instruments, to produce in another factory, and so on. And I was just talking, I heard about the Silex, when we started Silex. They had a big American customers who required a uh, proven production facility with ISO qualification, with uh, environmental policy and so on. And they were producing in KTH lab at that time, which was a showstopper for them. And when I discussed with him, he needed 100 million krona to invest to set up a production line. My idea was following why don't you make a contract with another factory, very similar factory in Neuschöpi, who has all this? And after convincing him, we made a contract. And he said, hey, I don't want to produce air. No, I know that. But you can show a contract that you have a factory, Fab, who has all the metals which is needed. So when he showed that for his American customer, this agreement which we made, it was enough for the customer to place his order. He knew there was a, a backup uh, in this factory, even though this factory could only produce maybe 70-80% of his uh, products. But there was, uh, and that is part of this big steel and borrow. I mean, he wasn't lying, but he wasn't telling the truth either. And he got the order, he got started, and he could produce in the lab in, in G-Star until he could get money. He was ma making money out of that and could invest then in his other factory outside. And now it is uh, quite a success company, I think. I think many of you know the company quite well here. Yeah, any questions? Everyone's hungry? No questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then we'll see you in the panel debate.